Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Going Ballistic Podcast. Can you believe it? It's episode number 29, and guess who we have with us? Say hello, Jason. Hey, sorry I missed everybody last week. I was a little bit under the weather, but I'm glad to be back. Are you feeling better now? I am, actually. (laughs) Good, good. We're glad to have you back. So you said even though you were too sick to join us on the podcast, you may have gone out shooting. What did you go do? Uh, yeah, I was too sick for the podcast cause I was losing my voice and a little bit of that, but Saturday I was up in Flagstaff, uh, doing some work up there and thought this would be a good opportunity to shoot my rifles and figure out my altitude change. Uh, since I do hunt up in that area from where I normally sight in my rifles, uh, so I could record that cause we discussed that in a, uh, previous podcast that even though like, uh, the Vortex website tells you where your zero is at that altitude you really don't know your zero until you shoot there from somewhere else um can i rephrase that yes so jason's not talking about what i think you guys might think he's talking about which is the difference you're going to have on your zero or the difference you're going to have on your bullet so let's say you know what your bullet does at 400 yards out of your rifle and you change altitude or location or something and then what that difference is going to be what he's talking about is even with the awesome stuff like you guys by now if you haven't checked out vortex's free ballistic calculator you're crazy it's like super nice um and it's accurate but what he's saying is when you make those changes the software that the way it's set up you usually start with certain parameters and then it figures out what it's going to do to your bullet at 400. Well, the problem is if you zeroed the rifle at a certain location and got your data at that next location, if you're comparing 400 yards to 400 yards, it'll give you the difference. But the problem is some of these aren't taking into account that your zero would actually be different. I, I, I thought I was going to make it clear, but I may have just made it more, <laughs> more muddy. Yeah. Sorry. The idea is that your data that you use to shoot at distance is always relative to your zero. If that there's another way to think about this. When you shoot at 400 yards or 500 yards for me, my 308, I come up 12 minutes of angle. Well, 12 minutes of angle doesn't mean anything unless you're comparing it to my zero. It's 12 minutes of angle up from my 100 yard zero. And Correct. the problem is when you just change the atmospheric locations, it might be saying, oh, instead of coming up 12, you need to come up 13 at distance, or you only need to come up 11 at a certain distance. But the problem is you've also got to think about your initial zero changed. So instead of just changing the amount you come up from that baseline zero, well, your zero also changed. So actually, if both of them change together, you might still be coming up 12 minutes from the 100 yard zero. Is that any better or did I make it crazy again, Jason? No, no, no. So, and, and what I'm about to say will probably help out too. So where I originally sighted my rifles, um, there you go. The uh, the altitude is... <laughs> Everyone uh, that's watching us live instead of just listening to the podcast saw me just uh, add some accuracy juice to my coffee. So go ahead. <laughs> that's Sorry. right. Uh, so where I normally shoot at, you know, the altitude is roughly 3,200 feet. And that's where I have my zero. So where I was Which at... Is still higher than where you're living in the valley. Yes. So where I was at in Flagstaff is roughly 6,000 feet, right? So we have almost a 3,000 foot change. So my zero at 3,200 changed at 6,000 to an inch and a half higher, Mm -hmm. right? So that's what I needed to know for when I'm up there hunting. I need to make an inch and a half adjustment on my zero for my ballistic stuff to work. Right. And then you need to know from that zero what the relative change is to the distance. Right. Right. So yeah, so you still might be coming up at 12 minutes from your zero, but your zero is going to be different. So you need to take that into account. And if you don't, you can actually be off a couple inches. It's a lot smaller difference, but the software is, most software is just telling you, well, from your hundred yard zero, you need to come up this much. And really it never stops to ask, wait a minute, would your hundred yard zero have changed because of where you're at? So something to think about. Yeah, exactly. Now, what was interesting though, is when I took my 308 shot at a hundred yards to figure out what this difference was going to be, it was about a half inch to the left. And I mean, what distance are you shooting again? 100 yards. Okay. So, so that's really, that could be nothing, right? Well, I, I touched four out of five bullets. I mean, I literally touched them. Um, so I thought, okay, well, I'm shooting good, but what, why am I drifting a little bit left? So then I grabbed the AR, threw it up 
got in position, shot it, and it did the exact same thing. I thought, okay, well, this is a weird coincidence that both guns are shooting a little bit left when they both should be shooting perfectly straight. Yeah, so the part that he said where his group was touching, for everyone listening, the, the bolts were touching, that's really important. That's not just humble bragging. Because if he shot one round, it was a half inch left of where he intended at 100 yards, that's just called a normal day? Yeah, it, right. It if, just he, if the other bullet hit dead center and the other bullet hit a half inch to the right, that's just called a one inch group. So I don't know if someone's telling me a group size or an error they have, what kind of accuracy deviation I'm expecting. So now that we know that his groups were touching, we know that wasn't just him being happened to be a half inch to the left for that shot. The entire group, the, the average, the center of that group was also a half inch to the left, correct? Correct. And okay. I thought, well, maybe I bumped the scope or maybe something's goofy. Uh, so that's when I switched guns and I got the exact same results. So now I'm turning to you. I, I don't know. I can't imagine that me changing altitude or anything like that would change that at 100 yards. Same ammo. Same ammo. Same temperature. Uh, no, temperature was a little different. Not drastic, though. Um, Not more 10, than 10 degrees. Yeah, 10 at best, 12 degrees. Okay. So uh, the reason I'm asking that for everyone wondering is, uh, and honestly, part of this I don't completely understand as well as I wish I did, but different velocities of bullets out of the same gun will actually not just change height, you know, up and down on the target. They will change side to side sometimes. And that is because of the barrel harmonics and how that barrel is whipping and where the bullet is when it leaves. There's an awful lot going on there. So it's not unheard of if you changed ammo to have your zero go left or right um, consistently. And it can just be because of that. It's different weight. It's leaving the barrel a little bit different. But you're shooting the same ammo and the temperature wasn't enough probably to make a change. Or even if it was, you're going to see a higher difference in temperature variation from your first shot sitting in the cold chamber to your third or fifth shot sitting in a warm chamber. That temperature variation is going to be more than you were experiencing outside anyway. Right. So if it was temperature, you would have seen that through the group. So the only other thing I can I think of is when you shoot, talk to me about where you normally shoot. Is it flat, shooting at an angle? Okay, so where I normally shoot my gun, there's mm -hmm. rolling hills, and I try to keep it as flat as I can where I set up a target, but it, it probably drops ever so slight um, from where right. I am to where I'm shooting. And you're going to think I'm crazy, but which direction are you shooting? North. Okay, That's... so north is the best direction to shoot if you can, right? So all shooting ranges are supposed to be to the north. Um, when you're shooting this other time, which direction were you shooting? South. Oh, okay. And was it like middle of the day, morning, afternoon, what? This was afternoon, so the sun was setting. It was probably 4.30, yeah. Okay. Uh, I should have said the hypothesis sooner so you guys would actually believe me, but just trust me here. So that means that by shooting to the south, Jason ha was looking towards where the path of the sun is. And when it's setting to the west, it's going to be to his right. Am I doing that math mm -hmm. correctly? That's correct. All right. So there's a good chance. I'm, I'm just guessing where the sun could have been. It's at least to his right side, but a little forward. So the sun is enough in enough forward of a position to the right to cast a shadow in the scope. I can't guarantee this is what happening, what was happening, but uh, it's a chance. I would, I'll actually see this from students in the same day they will shoot from the morning and then shoot again in the afternoon and i'll watch it happen on the paper I'm not kidding at 100 yards you can actually do it on purpose and make a lesson out of this is the way you remember it i'll tell you first and then i'll explain what might be happening the way you remember it is you pretend as if the sun's rays are actually pushing the bullet like they actually are able to move the bullet okay almost like they're wind that's how you remember which way it makes it happen. So if the sun is to your right, you can expect, it can happen, that your bullets are going to impact a little bit to the left. Now, the reason why it happens is because of scope shadow. And what happens is the sun from the right casts a shadow in the scope off the front of the objective housing that you're not used to seeing when you're shooting to the north. That shadow is going to mess with you because you're doing the right thing, Jason. You're getting behind the gun and you're knowing to get a good clear sight picture. And what you're doing is instead of really looking through the center of the scope, you're seeing that artificially induced shadow by the sun. I think it's not artificial, it's a real shadow, but it's not what we would normally call scope shadow, which is what it tells you you're not aligned properly in the scope. So you right. get this extra shadow happening in your scope, which makes you move your head a little bit to get rid of it. Now, you know when you're trying to get scope shadow in the scope, you can still have a little bit of a room of error. 
before sure. you start seeing scope shadow. So what you're doing is you're probably moving your eye to the extreme edge of that error. So you're not seeing shadow on the other side to get rid of the shadow by the sun. And by doing that, it moves the group on the paper. So you're aiming at the right spot, but you're not, you don't have proper sight alignment. You have proper sight placement and it's all because of the sun. So we will actually do that with some students. You have them shoot in the morning towards the sun and I will shut up about it. I won't say anything about it and just have them save the target. And most people don't care if they have a good group and it's a half inch one way or the other. I mean, for tactical scenarios, uh, it's fine. They could have just had a bad group. They could have had a bad position, not a big deal. But I'll have them save it and then we'll come back and do it in the afternoon. And not everybody, but half the class at least will have groups on the other side of the center. And it's caused by exactly the sun moving position like that. So very likely that happened, especially since you tried it with two different rifles, two different scopes, and it went the same way. Correct. And All right. I, I was unaware of that, so that's good to know. Um, but yeah, at, at first I thought, well, the first shot might've been mean. And of course, like he said, I actually touched four out of five and I thought, okay, well, I'm shooting good groups, time to grab another gun. And then when the other gun did the exact same thing, I'm like, all right, well, here's a good question for Ryan. I don't know what's going on here. What in the world is happening? Why don't you just pull out your phone and call <laughs> me? <laughs> I, I should, should have a service where I can just uh, FaceTime into people, try and help you. <laughs> there you go. Uh, tell you to focus on the reticle and, and have good trigger control. So cool, man. I think that's it. I mean, I, I have no idea if it happens again it. and you're not facing the sun, I would like to see that. So next time, if you see that happening and you have the opportunity, um, either get a sunshade or make a sunshade. And I've made some field expedient sunshades out of a box of the cardboard box from the ammo. Seriously, where the sun has been too much glare, I've taken the cardboard box, opened it up and shoved it on the front of the scope. So at least the shadow was consistent and it wasn't just cutting edge of the scope, the edge of the scope and putting a shadow into the glass. Yeah, right? what so I'll try if next. If the shadow all the way forward, it doesn't happen. Or if the sun's yeah. all the way in front of you, it doesn't happen. It's only when it's at that angle. And the next time it happens too, I'll try to keep in mind, I'll change the direction that I'm shooting and see what happens. Yeah, if you can. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I mean, that's nothing's happening with Coriolis or Yotvos effect or anything, especially at 100 yards. So don't worry right. about that, but it would just be the sun. Or maybe if you had the chance to do it morning and afternoon and watch the change. I mean, hopefully, if that's new to you, hopefully it's new to somebody listening. So if you just learn something, good. That's why you're tuning in, hopefully, is to get these little tips about long range shooting and to hear the discussion to make everybody better. Um, I, we've mentioned before that I'm starting another podcast soon uh, with the Firearms Radio Network, and I still don't think we're supposed to be telling people the title of it, so I got to tease it only. But I appreciate you guys tuning in here, and hopefully you guys will tune in there once I tell you about it. And uh, keep supporting our only sponsor, which is me. So <laughs> I, I try to keep the commercials to a minimum, but it's really just kind of my commercial. Uh, I actually just started with a new printer for the book, which will hopefully help me get in some bookstores better, the way the distribution channels work. And you guys don't care, but copy just came in, so I get to sit here and review it and make sure it printed out okay. And um, Rocket FFL. Uh, holy cow. Uh, yeah, you got a lot of <laughs> I had to fix everything. Yeah, I oh man, I got Rocket CCW is going. Um I'm I'm getting a hundred people a day to sign up for Rocket CCW. That's awesome. That's crazy, right? Now they're not paying anything yet because they're just signing up to be alerted. And who knows if any of you guys are really gonna go through with it. But I hope you like it. Um I'm actually uh flying down to Phoenix to do the course this weekend. Oh, that's and, right. And uh, I'll be doing some filming for Rocket CCW also. So if you guys know where um, major firearms media companies are located, there might be one in Phoenix. I'm doing the filming so we can do this. So it'll be nice to have Rocket CCW going. But Rocket FFL, yeah, I am. I'm Rocket Man. I like the, the Rocket FFL thing and it started working. So I figured I'd go with it. And another Rocket, uh, Rocket Lawyer. <laughs> it's not me. <laughs> they have an awesome name, but it's not me. Uh, they provide just an awesome service. And so I teamed up with them. I reached out and I said, hey, guys that are making their uh, FFLs or getting their businesses going, they need an easy, clean way to get their businesses started. And then also people doing trust and all that other kind of stuff. So I made a deal with them and they were happy to work with me, which is really rare because other people have said, I mean, just let's hear the firearms, they want nothing to do with me, uh, including like credit card processors. If you go to Rocket FFL's website, you look in the blog, I have a whole article on credit card processing. Because dealers cannot get credit cards processed because Stripe, PayPal, all those just say, no, there's no way we won't deal with anything with firearms or firearms accessories. So you have sometimes an uphill battle, but the good news is I'm forging the way between me and all the clients I represent. 
Uh, I have a same thing. I have a partnership with a credit card processor that not only I switched everything over to them because they save me so much money. So book sales and all that, I use them now. Um, and they're fire. They're not only farmers friendly. They're going after the farms industry. They want you all, you guys. So um, keep checking out for that stuff because it's it's things that help me. You know, when you it helps the relationship I have with Rocket Lawyer when you use them. But I think it also helps you because it's a a good cost firearms friendly solution. So anyway, go check them out. And it's all sorts of rockets, but I like it, even though it confuses me sometimes. Well, I had some questions about the FFL. Uh, okay, shoot. I'm not going to, you don't mind. We're not going to give away rocket FFL for free here on the podcast. Are we? No, 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 no. <laughs> I'm just kidding. So, um, not knowing anything about it and some of the stuff that we've talked about on the previous podcast, for instance, uh-huh. Get your FFL, you can buy and sell guns. Um, you could get silencers brought in. Those are all general descriptions. I'm assuming if you're gonna get your FFL, it's gotta be almost a business type setup. Like you'd have to get your state and federal tax IDs and and do a whole thing. Is it is am I on the right track for that? Um, you don't have to. Uh, so you can run a business as a sole proprietor. So you can get an FFL in your name. So you can get the Jason Kleckner FFL, and that's the name of the business, and that's the name on the FFL. That's perfectly legitimate. There's actually some cool reasons to do that. So if you did that, and you ended up getting a whole bunch of silencers and all sorts of cool toys that first year and decided, you know what, I don't want this anymore, you can actually give up your FFL, just surrender it, and everything in your inventory is just immediately yours. You wouldn't have to do a 4473. You wouldn't have to do the transfers to the silencers. You don't have to do anything because the taxpayer... So let me back up a little bit. So the an SOT is not a thing you get. It's a thing you become. I think we've talked about that. SOT stands for Special Occupational Taxpayer. So it's the type of taxpayer status you have with the federal government. And when you have an FFL and you want to deal with NFA stuff, instead of paying a tax per transfer, so it'd be like $200 to you, then $200 to your customers, you pay the tax once a year. And for most people, it's 500 bucks for the year. So by your third silencer, you're way ahead of the game. So you pay the tax once a year, and then every item that comes in and off your books, you don't pay a tax on because you're already good to go. You already have that you know, pass, if you will, because you are an SOT. Well, the SOT is the EIN or the employer identification number. It is the business. Okay. So if I set up shops all across the country, and it was all the same company, but I had an Omaha and a Phoenix and a, not California, but you know, a, a Houston and all these other locations of my company, I would have to have an FFL for each licensed premises because the FFL is for the location. Okay. But I would be the same SOT because I'm the same taxpayer. I'm the same company. So when I wanted the silencer to go from store one to store two, I just send it to store two. There's no form three transfers like you normally have to do between dealers. The only time you're doing a transfer is when it's actually changing possession from one taxpayer to the next taxpayer. Now, even you as a consumer are considered the taxpayer. So if you're going to a gun store to buy a silencer, that's a transfer from one taxpayer to the next taxpayer, which is why the next taxpayer has to pay a tax. So that's if you think about it that way, it helps answer a lot of questions. So if you're the same taxpayer, knock yourself out. There is no transfer taking place. You right. would just do a normal bound book transaction as if it were any other gun. So if you're a sole proprietor and you decide not to be in the business anymore, every single item that was an NFA item that was assigned to a taxpayer is still with that taxpayer. Right. You're the individual. The problem though is be careful. And no one, don't anyone think that I'm saying something cute like you can read between the lines. Do not get an FFL as a scheme to try and get a bunch of stuff and then give up the FFL. That's not only against the law, it's actually something the ATF will go against you on. So you need to have the intent to be engaged in the business when you get your FFL. Now the intent is not the same thing as doing, right? I can have the intent to be engaged in the business of selling firearms. I can buy my first Glock and I can put it up on GunBroker for MSRP. And I'll tell you right now, a Glock will not sell on GunBroker for MSRP, okay? It's just not going to happen. The auction site, things go for cheaper. Now, if the ATF came by, now the ATF is not allowed to inspect you the entire first year. They have to leave you alone. So let's say they come to me a year and a day, and I've been sitting with that same Glock on, on GunBroker. I haven't sold it. The ATF is not going to. Well, they might question me. They might ask about it, but that's all they can do. 
they're not going to say, oh, you haven't sold a single thing. You're not engaged in the business. I can say, yes, I am. I'm intending to sell this product. Just because a customer hasn't come to your store in a while or just because someone's not buying it doesn't mean that you don't have the intent to be engaged in the business. Does that make sense? Yep. But if you get the FFL with this plan, you're lying on a federal form. You're going to be in serious trouble because you're saying on the form, yes, I intend to be engaged in the business. Now, I'd love to have all this extra information to help prove that your intent was real. I'd love to see that you're actually selling guns. I'd love to see that you're actually promoting and marketing guns or demonstrating them. And if you weren't selling a single gun in the first year, okay, maybe I think you should give it up. I'm just saying technically, legally, don't measure by how many you actually sell or how much money you actually make, but just go into it, everybody, please. I mean, if you use me especially, I will, I will tell you to stop when we're done if you don't have the true intent to do it. But if you decide to get out of it, you don't have to worry about all this inventory now. It can just come to you personally. But even with all that benefit, I still don't think people should do it as a sole proprietor. I think there's too much liability. I think you should do it as an LLC at least just to protect you and your family. And to start an LLC, I think through Rocket Lawyer, they charge less than 100 bucks. And you click, 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 and you're done. The LLC is done. <laughs> it's right. like you can even you can hire them to be a registered agent in your state. Or you can use uh, who I like, uh, Delaware Inc. I have links to them all over the site too. They can actually register your LLC in Delaware. So it seems really... You know, not seems, it is really uh, lawsuit and business friendly. So anyway, it, it sounds like it's complicated and I'm, I might be making more complicated because I'm just trying to skim the surface. But there's a whole chapter in the course, which you need to be taken, Jason. There's a whole chapter in there on <laughs> what business type you should make, how you should form it and everything. So I think it's chapter three is everything you need for your business. Well, and like you said, I mean, you, you need to be serious about doing it. And I haven't pulled the trigger because... I'm, I'm weighing it out. I mean, do I have the time to actually get into that? Mm -hmm. um, I actually like the silencers on the trust for, you know, the kids and yeah. they get old enough, of course. And of course, mm -hmm. Jared, when he comes down, which he's moving back to Phoenix, he'll be here this weekend. That'd be awesome. Now, another thing you can do with silencers and sharing is only do this if it's going to be legitimate, people. This isn't me trying to have you read between the lines again. But your employees are allowed to possess your NFA items for a bona fide business purpose. Right. Now, let's so say you can have employees that are, you know, regional salespeople across the country. Now, don't you can do that to be kind of cute, but you need to back it up. You know, you don't do it just to have a bunch of silencers at your buddy's house. But if he's right. going to be able to go out and demonstrate things for you, especially if you make stuff, if you manufacture anything and you have people that are legitimately selling and it's a legitimate purpose, yeah, you're allowed to do that. Now, let's say hypothetically, I give this a shot. It doesn't work out for me. Since I do like to put my stuff on a trust, I would imagine I would have to resubmit forms to transfer from myself to my trust, even though they're mine. Yes, so because the trust is its own taxpayer. Correct. The trust is as if it was a person, just like a business is. A business is right. like its own person. So yeah, every jump. So if you've got a trust, stick with it. And if you don't have a trust, you might as well stick with it. Either one. Right. But your firearms inventory you're going to get for being an FFL is going to be hopefully to be selling. So don't worry about that anyway. You, you right, want to right. get a silencer and you like it and you want to jump that silencer from your FFL to your personal collection. My opinion, you should be paying the tax and transferring it to yourself. Keeping it on your inventory just to play with it is, is dangerous. Correct. So, all right. Is that, those are your only questions or you have any more? Uh, no, that's kind of where I was right. at with it. Good. We can, we can save more for next time. Anyway, I feel bad if I'm boring people about getting an FFL, but, uh, honestly, even if you don't use rocket FFL, uh, and you're a gun guy, you're kind of crazy for not getting one for a few reasons. You save money on guns. You make money on guns. <laughs> you get all these write-offs on guns for her business stuff. You know, when I go shoot because I want to go test out a product. Uh, that ammo is a write-off, guys. I'm using the ammo in connection with my business, right? That's what I'm doing. I want to get a new spotting scope. You can bet I'm using that spotting scope for training and teaching sniper students. That's a business write-off. That's another way I like to do it. But the third one is it's kind of fun being the go-to guy in your circle of friends. It's kind of nice being the guy that people come over to the house to hang out and see you and do a transfer for guns or you're the one to go to. So anyway, enough about that. Um, oh, the shirt, I already told Jason about it. I think it's backwards for you guys. Uh, I got a new printer for the shirts. I like these a lot better. And it's actually Amazon. Amazon got into the t-shirt business and they 
I got invited to their cool new store. And so you can buy these straight on Amazon and they print from Amazon and ship straight to you. So Jason's getting some because it's his name. Might as well. That's right. I need to have them. If you guys want some, I'd appreciate it. I was thinking tonight over dinner, I need to do another giveaway. So let me know in the comments what kind of gun you guys would like. Keep it reasonable. You're not getting a Kleckner rifle. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but pick a gun that's like reasonable. I don't know. Maybe I like Tikas so much or stuff like that. Uh, I might get one of those. Who knows? But I think I should do a giveaway that has some sort of connection to, you know, you get the shirt and send in a picture of you with the shirt somewhere. And I don't know. I haven't thought all the details, but I'd like to really launch the shirts out there and get the brand out there. And if that means I could give away a free rifle to do it, uh, I can do that because I have an FFL. <laughs> or what about the uh, the new pistol that you like so much? Your PZ-10. Ooh. Um, you, guys, you guys tell me. If you guys like... And by the way, I've been shooting that more and more. <sighs> that that's, that's my favorite gun right now. That I mean, CZP-10 is awesome. I know this is about long-range shooting, but you always got to have your oh. sidearm, right? Yeah, we're, we're off on all sorts of shooting here. I think I'll always go back to long-range stuff. <laughs> oh, but now, now people are getting greedy. Tika, stainless steel, laminated. Okay, that one's reasonable. And then they want a Tika attack A1 there on YouTube in the comments, which, by the way, I'm glad you guys have joined. It's awesome seeing the live chat go by, and I'm sorry if I'm not responding to everybody. But anyway, Damn glad to have you on there. Um, so have you been – well, I'll just tell you. So in firearms news, there's been two kind of big firearms legal stuff. Uh, Steven wants my Glock 19 because he knows I want the uh, CZP-10 so bad. <laughs> <laughs> um, so in firearms legal news, it's actually been kind of a hot topic uh, lately and uh, have a couple articles in recoil in the same day, which is kind of cool. I, actually, I don't even know if they published a the second one yet, but it's coming. So there's a teaser for you. Uh, check out, keep watching recoil site or I'll share it on Facebook. Um, the things that are happening are one, did you see what Silencer Co. released at all, Jason? I did, actually. What do you the, think about uh, that? For the black powder rifles, correct? Yeah. <laughs> I didn't read the whole thing. I have it on my phone. I still need to get to it. I started to kind of browse through it. So if you know all the details, explain. All right. So Silencer Co. did something awesome. I think they kind of did something stupid too, but we'll start with the awesome first. <laughs> okay. The awesome is they were creative enough to think outside the box to try and get around the federal laws um, and get around in a good way, like creatively navigate the laws, not, you know, do anything bad. Uh, yeah. Casey says one of these Maxim fifties when it comes out, that'd be funny. That's true. Casey, I could ship it to anyone that lives in the United States, except for New Jersey and California and some other States. That's what we're going to talk about is it's not really legal in every state. Uh, they said it was, but that's the stupid thing we'll get to next. <laughs> so under federal law, which is what I practice for firearms law. So I get people questions every day at least one question about state laws and i'm not licensed probably in your state i mean i might be but not every state so i have to tell people you know sorry i, I can't ship it to you uh, casey's defending that's why i said in the free united states oh gotcha <laughs> i thought he meant ship it for free <laughs> not the free united gotcha there casey um so i do fire federal firearms law only is what i like to practice and what i can represent people on so on federal law genius i mean super great so here's the deal First, the definition of a firearm, and you can tell I'm getting excited for people that are watching because we're getting into the geeky legal stuff here. The federal definition of a firearm involves four parts in the Gun Control Act. It is a weapon that expels a projectile by the action of an explosive. And for everyone, I'm actually going off memory here, so if I say it not precisely, that's why. And I, I said weapon and I paused because I don't think it should be a weapon, it should be an object because you could actually argue, even if I made something that goes bang and a bullet comes out, but it's not a weapon, then technically it's not a firearm. A weapon is how you use something. A shovel's a weapon if you use it as one. So that that's just a side note. That's always bothered me that's in the law, is that a weapon that does this, you don't know if it's a weapon or not yet. A hammer is a weapon if you use it as one. But anyway, so they it's let's just call it an object. If an explosion goes off, if you got a bang and a projectile, a bullet goes flying out one end of it, that's a firearm. That's the first definition. The second definition is the frame or receiver of anything we just covered. So not only is the entire rifle a firearm, just the receiver of that rifle or the frame of the handgun is also a firearm. Kind of like when you take a car apart into hundreds of parts. You don't have hundreds of cars. You still have one car, but you just need to pick one piece to decide which one piece is the car. So we call it the frame of the car. 
Same thing with the gun. So you have the entire gun and the frame or receiver of the gun. Now, within those two definitions also includes anything that can be readily converted to fire a projectile. That's that whole 80% receiver thing. We won't get into that now. That's not a legal term. It's a kind of a misnomer. But you can be part of the way complete. But once you cross a magic line to where the ATF has decided, okay, now at this point, somebody could easily finish this and make it into a gun, that's also a gun. The third definition is silencers, which bothers me too because it doesn't expel projectiles and it doesn't belong in the Gun Control Act, but anyway. And the fourth definition is destructive devices like grenades. So we can skip that one for now. <laughs> Let's just talk about the first three. Well, exempted from that definition are antique weapons. And then if you go down further in the law, and you can, if you go to the Recoil's, Recoil's website and or you go on my Facebook page, you see the link. I wrote all this for Recoil and explained it all out, what it all means and why. So the exemptions, the antique firearms, is an antique firearm is any firearm made before 1899 and leave it to the federal government in the law. They say made in 1898 or before. They couldn't just say before 1899, but anyway, <laughs> <laughs> um, is exempted as an antique firearm, which means no FFL needed, ship it interstate, no problem. Even people that can't have guns can have those because it's not a firearm. So it's kind of a weird area there. Or any gun that's a replica of one of those guns. And I don't mean replica in that it looks like it, but a replica in how it functions. So matchlock, flintlock, percussion cap, essentially muzzle loaders. As long as these replicas don't fire conventional ammunition, that's readily available. So you can even have an antique gun that shoots conventional ammo. It's not just muzzle loaders. It can shoot a you know, center fire, rim fire cartridge. As long as it's so rare or unique that you don't, can't go to Cabela's and find it on the shelf. Okay, so that's kind of the weird antique firearms definition. So a muzzle loader, even if it's made this morning, as long as it can't be readily converted to fire a normal projectile, it's not a firearm, which means you can buy it out of a catalog. You take a Cabela's catalog, order a muzzle loader out of the catalog, and it'll ship straight to your front door. But that readily converted part is really important because some muzzle loaders are so close they can easily be converted. Those don't count. And some muzzle loaders, you can buy another barrel. You can buy a bar like a 30 out 6 barrel for your muzzle loader. You put that thing on and it fires normal 30 out 6 cartridges. Well, that means if you have one of those muzzle loaders, that even in its muzzle loader configuration, it's a firearm because one reason is it can be readily converted to be a firearm. So it's a firearm already. And the other reason is if it can take that 30 out 6 barrel, that must mean that you have the frame or receiver of a firearm already. So that's the other reason. It's a firearm. So you got to be careful with those. But it's still amazing because even a black powder rifle, even like the one behind me, explodes and sends a projectile. And that's... Yeah, that's why it has to be an exemption. So they say, all of these are the rule except for these. And then like, what about uh, the super high-powered air rifles that are now coming out? They're starting to hit speeds of a twenty-two. Oh yeah, there, there's air rifles you can hunt with that can take it down a deer. Um, they're not firearms. That's so you, you make a potato gun, okay? So you go to make a potato gun for shooting in your backyard. If you make one that uses hairspray, you put the hairspray in there, use the barbecue sparker, and it goes boom and the, pot the potato comes out, that's a firearm. That is 100% a firearm, okay? Now, if you make a potato gun that has a Schrader valve on it and you pump it up with a bike pump or an air compressor, and then you use like a valve to release the air pressure, which are my favorite kind of potato guns anyway, because you can get them way more powerful that way. That's not a firearm, no explosion. So two potato guns that look the same, the pneumatic one, you can actually get better performance out of, not a firearm, the combustible one, firearm. Now it's not against the law to make one, contrary to popular belief, you can make firearms. Not only just can you make potato guns, you can make your own guns without serial numbers, without markings, without anything under federal law, big disclaimer, federal law. You know, you can't make potato guns in New York City. Not going to happen. Now, those air rifles in states like New Jersey, the state law of New Jersey has said that anything that shoots a projectile, regardless of how it shoots it, is a firearm. So even a Daisy lever action BB gun in New Jersey is treated as if it was a full firearm. So be careful with your state laws. So that's yep. what the, so that's what Silencer Co. did. They're like, well, if a muzzle loader. That's the right kind of muzzle loader. You know, like when I was at Remington, they made the Remington M700 muzzle loader. And it took me to come running going, what are you doing? It's still a muzzle loader, but it is built on a 700 action. 
which means it's a firearm because it has the frame or receiver of a firearm in it. So we had to like warn everybody, the dealers, hey, it's a muzzle loader, but it's not like your other muzzle loaders. This one's got to be in your bound book and has to go into 4473 because of the receiver. So if you have a true muzzle loader, like what Silencer Co. used, I think is what they used, uh, it is not a firearm. It can be shipped through the mail interstate as long as it doesn't go into uh, one of the states that specifically prohibits it. Or at least New Jersey doesn't prohibit it per se. I, again, I'm not a New Jersey lawyer. I don't know. They just treat it like a firearm, which means it's just got to go through the normal process there. So they took one of those and then they made a silencer, but not really a silencer. And I hope they're creative on how they assembled it because it matters. So a silencer is defined as any device that diminishes the report of a firearm, of a portable firearm. So if you as a factory wanted to test guns and you built an entire huge box that you put the gun into to shoot and it kept the noise down, arguably that's a silencer. It's a device that diminishes the report of a firearm. Arguably a room could be a silencer. If you built a range and you built a special room to shoot in and it made the gun quieter, technically that could be something that diminishes the report of a firearm, but it's not portable. That's the definite difference. So that big machine or box you would make for uh, industrial use, it's not portable, not a silencer. You bolted it. If you actually made something and bolted it to the concrete and welded it down so it wasn't easily portable, I'd make a good argument for you legally that it wasn't a silencer either. So they took some, they took a device kind of like a silencer and they have it permanently attached to the muzzle loader. So if it's permanently attached, that means it's not easy to use on a firearm unless you got out a, a grinder or a hacksaw, cut it, threaded it, and rewelded it onto a firearm. And by the time you've done that, you've done as much work as being required to make a new silencer from scratch anyway. Right. So by having it attached, it's not freely portable to be used on a firearm because it's physically attached to a muzzle loader. Now, if you, again, you decide to get this thing, you're cute and you cut it off, you just made a silencer. And again, you can make your own silencers as long as you live in a free state. You just got to do the right paperwork first. You know, there are air guns out there that have quote unquote silencers built into the air guns. Now, I've had to be part of this with ATF technology folks and with some other people working with air gun companies to make sure that the silencer, that when it, by the time it's taken off, it's completely destroyed so that someone couldn't just easily buy an air gun with a silencer on it, take off a silencer and put it on a 22. So same principle applies. So it's genius. They're like, hey, non-firearm, non-silencer, but we all know it acts like a silencer and it acts like a firearm. So they got around these exemptions. So again, kudos to them. Now the downside to it is, if you've ever shot a black powder rifle, you have any idea how dirty that can is going to get? Oh, horrible. Yes, I, I made a joke on Facebook. That I think they should ship it with a can and, and dunking solvent. So when you get home, you can just put the can in the solvent and just let it soak till the next time you need to shoot it. But it's still pretty cool. I mean, I get comments all the time about Rocket FFL. Uh, screw you. You're supporting government gun control. No, I'm not. The law is the law. You can either not have an FFL and not get guns, you know, and break the law and do it, you know, and not have the guns at all. Do it without an FFL and just break the law or just get it and have it. So obeying the law, I don't think is necessarily always giving into the law. That's the circumstance we are now. So that's what they did. They're like, hey, here's the law. Here's a really cool way to enjoy it. And some people have even said the same thing to them. Like, oh, by doing this, you're just like, you're giving into the power of the law. <laughs> yeah. Anytime you follow the law, I guess you're doing that. <laughs> so you might as well just <laughs> stop speeding. You might as well make all the machine guns you want on your own. Because if, you know, forget it, if you're just not going to obey the law. So it's really cool that they did that. The problem is, um, and I'm saying this because it's me. Nobody asked me, hey, should we say this is legal in 50 states? Because the second I, I knew about it in advance, but the second it came out, I just shook my head like, oh, no, this is not legal in all 50 states. I wish I could have solved this like in two seconds. So as soon as it happened, I had the article or at, at that time, I, I'm going to be careful how I say this. At the time, I put together the article explaining what's going on here in that federal law. Yes, but state law, which, by the way, I'm not going to say what every single state does or doesn't allow. But I do know that there's going to be problems in at least some states. And here's some examples. So we put that on a recoil and it's been a popular article for them. So I'm glad, I'm glad they wanted it out there. And did you just get way more of the law and guns than you ever wanted, Jason? No, it's good, man. I enjoy this stuff actually. <laughs> See, you need your FFL. You need to be making guns. There's, there's no reason we don't have the Phoenix branch or the collecting rifle company. Oh dude, my buddies are all over me to get it done. And I'm like, I'm trying to weigh out my time because Oh, to build, to build some ARs? 
uh, just ARs, sell guns. Yeah, my buddies are all over me to do it. And I'm like, I would love to do it. And I have to manage a little more time so I can actually do it properly. But uh, it's hard enough just to get out and shoot the guns I got, let alone I start selling guns. <laughs> and remember, so like an average price for RL Cheapo build was like, let's call it 400 bucks. Would you call that about average? Yeah. You can buy ARs for 400 bucks right now. Right. So my favorite source for just my email, I get too many emails like everybody else, but my favorite email to look at to see what's getting a good deal is CDNN. Do you get their email? No, I always oh, get Paul Meadows. I'm on Paul Meadows. Meadows is good. Three a week. Right. CDNN, check them out. They will have some of the smoking deals on stuff. Like when I wanted to outfit one of my new uh, shotguns with chokes, chokes can be expensive. They can be 60, 80 bucks for some chokes. Went on CDNN, navigated the chokes. I picked up every choke. I got I, I got a whole set of chokes because they were three fifty a piece. Wow. So I mean you can't beat that. And then other stuff sometimes is normal price. So CDNN, by the way, is uh, the industry equivalent of a liquidation house. So to the industry guys from like the manufacturing company side, we'll actually check CDN CDNN all the time to see who is in trouble. And we'll actually call each other and bust each other's chops when you see that. So like you're watching it and all of a sudden you see a bunch of Remington Golden Saber all over the CDNN email, you know that means that somebody was having trouble moving a warehouse full of it, so it went to CDNN <laughs> or Smith and Wesson or Colt, the same kind of thing. So it's a way as a metric to see what's going on in the industry because they just have the most random stuff for cheap. Anyway, they're putting out. You can get I think DPMS AR fifteens for four hundred bucks, three ninety nine. Wow! So man, we you and I wanted to hurry up and get the build done before the prices went up, but now we right can... now they're down lower. Exactly. <laughs> no. Which is why everyone tells me, oh, don't get an FFL. Guns are cheap. And I say, yeah, the worst time to get into business is when inventory is cheap. <laughs> <laughs> you should wait till it's really, really expensive. That's right. And you can't get any inventory and you can't find an AR-15 anywhere. That's when you should get into business. But anyway. <laughs> so getting to, oh my gosh, all these comments over here. I'm so sorry, uh, everyone, for ignoring it. Uh, part of me is balancing the people that listen to the podcast and the people that are doing this. Uh, free United States. Could the ATF turn around and say, nope, uh, Brandon asked that. Could the ATF just change their mind? Yes, they can, but they'd be wrong. Now the ATF has changed their mind on some things before when they give rulings or opinions that I think are incorrect. And the good news is we usually squash them pretty fast and have the ATF turn around on it, but the ATF doesn't make those laws. That's Congress. So Congress made the gun control act and the gun control act definitions are what they are. Now the ATF can interpret what readily converted means. That's where the ATF has power. They can define, well, you could get that silencer off with within 10 minutes with a hacksaw and therefore that's readily converted. So yeah, they could do that, Brandon, but they can't change the law. Now, who can is Congress. So I don't care who's in office and who you think is great. Uh, Trump seems really friendly to guns, but everyone said that Obama was like the worst thing ever for guns. And you know what he did for guns? Nothing. He didn't make guns any more banned or restricted or harder, did he? I mean, we had Operation Gunwalker that was horrible and people should go to jail for that. Uh, the ATF did require border states to start re making extra reporting, which I think is uh, unconstitutional, maybe too strong to say, but that wasn't that bad for what everyone was afraid of. So I'm glad we have Trump in, but I hope he's not the opposite of Obama because that might mean regulations. You never know. He might need to make a deal somewhere and, and trade something else. So who knows what Congress can do uh, or what they will do, but they could change it. Uh, Joshua asked, do they have savvy felons out there shooting muzzleloaders? Yeah. Yeah, you do, Josh. Um, I have known stories of felons carrying uh, the muzzleloading revolvers because they have a firearm that shoots six shots and it's not illegal for them to possess under federal law, uh, as far as I know. So nobody go out and do it and go to jail and blame me. But yes, that is that is like a known thing for people to do. So yes, the ATF banned shoelaces. Yes. And uh, killed some people over it too. Uh, it was a horrible, horrible scenario. And there's actually a great documentary on Netflix about Ruby Ridge. Uh, you should check that out where someone you know, they, was accused of using a shoelace to make a machine gun. And so therefore they said, whatever the device you use is, is also a machine gun. So they banned shoelaces and called machine gun shoelaces. That really happened. Crazy stuff. Anyway. That's um, crazy. Cra oh yeah. And um, mother uh, running with her baby shot and killed as she's running out of the house. It was a horrible deal. Horrible, horrible, horrible scenario. So anyway, uh, so that's what's going on in that news. And then the other news is the Export Control Reform Initiative, Export Control Reform Initiative. And that's actually ties into what I was saying about President Obama and Trump. Now, you guys got to believe me, I'm not President Obama's fan at all. 
but he did do a couple of great things for our industry. One, he was the salesman of the years, right? He helped sell more guns than anybody else. <laughs> but two, he did this thing called export control reform, and he was trying to push that through. And Jason, I'm going to use your judgment here. I'm looking at the clock. I've been rambling forever about legal stuff. I'm happy. Yes, Stephen, you're right. Murder is the word. They did murder them. It is, it is disgusting what happened there. And there's other scenarios too. So Jason, you tell me, um, this is easily a 20 minute talk. I think we should maybe save it till next week. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I'm what do you think? That. Yeah. I mean, I, we've, I've rambled on enough. I, I don't, I want to tell you guys cause it's current, but I also don't want to bore you. So instead I'll just point you to the recall article about it and you can check it out and we'll talk next time. And then I have a question that we can wrap this up with. All right, shoot. Is, is there any new news on the hearing protection act? Cause that lately has been popping up everywhere. I <sighs> dude. <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> No, there's tons of news about it. But the problem is, uh, if some if there is an expert on what's going on, it's not me. And even the people that say they're <laughs> experts, I, I think they're full of it. Because this is why. If I I would have lost a lot of money if you were allowed to bet on the Hearing Protection Act. I, I thought there's no <laughs> way that it's going to make it as far as it has. It just it seemed impossible to be in the political environment. And yet here it is. So I'm at least honest enough with you all to say, uh, I was wrong and I was so wrong <laughs> that whatever I tell you now might be just as wrong. So here's the problem is silencers. <sighs> okay. I'm going to do this just so you guys have something controversial and you can make me eat my words. I don't think they're ever going to be mainstream legal, like non-regulated. I, I just think it's a bridge too far. I think there are plenty of people that would consider themselves moderate gun owners, even not like moderate politically, but they're just like they're gun owners. Guys, we're some of our, our, our community, are our own worst enemy. We have guys out there that still say, um, you shouldn't have AR 15s or AR 15s have no use for hunting or things like that. Well, first off, the second amendment has nothing to do with hunting, but we have gun owners that are saying things like that, that can hurt us. So Casey added that past committee is head of the floor. Yes, uh, you're right. Um, it's, and it's gone through a couple committees, which was where most things die. So it's amazing that's going through and it might happen. And, and the reason it might happen even more is it's tied in with the share act and the share act is an awesome public land initiative that, um, I've been working on or helping work on for years, especially from the trade association. So it's a good, good deal and piggybacking those might be a way for it to get through. But the problem is the average person that I can talk to. And remember, I, I talk to college students and I talk about constitutional laws. So I'm on hot button issues with people that don't necessarily agree with me. But even if I can get somebody to agree that it's okay for me to own guns, even though they don't like them. So I, you picture that type of person. It's like, okay, this person's saying they don't like guns, but they understand that it's a right. They understand the reason to own them and they don't have a problem with you doing it. Kind of like the vegetarian that doesn't care that you eat steak. Okay. Even if I can get that person to agree with it's okay to own guns, they're not going to be okay with silencers most likely. And then as I move down the spectrum more and more towards gun owners, I still find people. There are people that we know, Jason, that I won't out on the podcast that have said to me, yeah, I think guns are great. I think I should have guns with silencers. Oh, no, 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 no. Who, you know, only criminals would need silencers. That'd be horrible if they did it. <laughs> right. I know. I hear it all the time. So just because of that, I just can't, I just can't imagine, you know, uh, Mary Jo America in the middle of the country being completely okay with that, especially cause it's so easy to villainize. It's so easy to talk about you know, them in movies and things like that. Even though England allows them like you can walk in and buy it over the counter. I just, I don't know. Just this political climate. I don't think it would happen. Um, well, but, um, yeah. And I'm fine with filling out the forms. Uh, I'd be happy if they just waived the $200 fee. I've still fill out my forms and oh, yeah. the process and. Oh yeah. Yeah. Protect that $200 fee is what stabs me. It's like, wow. Right. So what I've proposed and no one listens to me, so it doesn't matter, but I proposed a, a card now before everyone gets all pissed at me cause I'm for registration or stuff. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not saying this is my fresh idea. It's not me saying, Hey, I got a great idea. We should do this. I'm saying as an alternative to what we do now, the lesser of two weevils is have a card that I don't know. I'd renew it every year that says this guy is good to go. And it's my NFA card and I can walk in and buy a silencer with it over the counter, but I got to have my NFA card. I go through all the same background checks. So you're getting all the same background check, all the same, everything you would do when I put in a form four for buying a silencer or getting an FFL, which is actually what an FFL is. It's kind of like a, this dude's good to make machine guns card. But if you could have those for non FFLs. Okay. So that was the other pitch for you guys. That's why you should get one. <laughs> but for people <laughs> that don't want to get their FFL for some reason, 
have some sort of vetted system that you can still have the same checks. Heck, you might get more checks. You could check them once a year, whereas you buy silencers, you might get checked only once every 10 years. And you could be vetted by the government and it wouldn't have any burden on time or anything. Even for the money, yeah, I don't want to pay the $200 tax either. But if I had a chance to get that card and I still had to pay the tax, but I could have the silencer right away, that would still be way, way, way better than we have now. But people get mad at me for saying that because it's compromise. Yeah, I I don't know, man. I, I Since I got my first one, it's been amazing out hunting, especially with, you know, going out and shooting the AR or the 308. And earmuffs get in the way when I'm shooting because they get hung mm-hmm. up on the butt of the stock, you know, so that's a hindrance. And then you got to get, you know, the plug-in earplugs. But for me, when I'm out walking around, especially with an AR, the last thing I want to do is have to wear earplugs or earmuffs because we have too many rattlesnakes and stuff. I like to hear the buzzing noise before, oh, you know. That's a str- <laughs> I know what you mean. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I see what you're saying. And it's good for he- you know for hearing safety and things. But the problem is some people say, uh, I think they make the argument too much that it's for health benefits because I think the problem with that is there's also all the gases and crap you get back in your face, which is actually kind of bad for you with a silencer. So I'm not right. saying don't use it, but don't like put all of your arguments at the health altar, you know, cause it could be that or even worse. They could mandate it. They can be like, Oh, you're right. Silencers are so much better. Fine. Everyone's got to have one now. Oh, and no betterment for restrictions. You could shut down a public shooting range like that by making everyone there have to have a silencer on there. So anyway, so people are saying to put me on their payroll and send them cans. <laughs> I'm actually, <laughs> I, I'll admit here because I finished my coffee with accuracy juice in it. I've thought like how in the world could I make this like huge like co-op business <laughs> or this huge co-op trust where like everybody could be on it so we could all just buy silencers and tr- but the problem is I wouldn't want to trust everybody. So yeah. Okay. Well, you got anything else, man? Uh, that's a good question that you just got there. How does it work in the military as a sniper with a silencer? Uh, same as it works without being a sniper. What do you mean? Like, like uh, do we use them or not? Well, I would imagine, do you have to check it in? Are you allowed to just carry it on you? Um, that's oh, I see what you're saying. Oh, yeah. so, whenever, so if you're deployed, your guns are with you. Um, it depends on the unit, I guess, the military unit. So I would actually be getting into a cot and move my boots and I would knock a law. One of those old rocket launchers from Vietnam. Mm-hmm. So Rangers still have those because they're tinier and easier to use than the big AT4s. I would like knock a law over and then reach down for a flashlight and pick up a grenade and be like, no, it's not the flashlight. Okay, so we had like stuff everywhere. But I know that most units on military bases actually have to check their stuff into arms rooms. So even deployed, they have to check it in. But in the rear, oh, definitely. So everything with a serial number, including your night vision, all that stuff is highly controlled. Now, you don't have to turn your night vision in necessarily, but you have to have accountability for like crazy. So much so is you lose one of those things. You lose a laser designator off of your rifle and everybody in your unit will be out there all night walking arm in arm trying to find it in the woods. And that's happened before. It is miserable. Your fir- the first sergeant will make everyone's life miserable if a, a, a serialized item, a radio and anything goes missing. It's insane, the control. So we have silencers checked into the arms room just like with the gun. But just like in the military, you walk around with a machine gun all the time. That's your job. So you, there's no ATF issue at all with that. Um, one argument would be uh, you're an employee with a bona fide business purpose. So there you go. You know, yeah. Uh, when I was an employee of Remington, I had a legitimate purpose. I'd take a machine gun in the silencer somewhere, go travel across the country and shoot it and demo it and do something and come back. So I was allowed to possess it for that way. So I, I'd imagine it's probably the same type of exemption. But no, you just check it out and do your job. And if you ha- your job requires you to stay out for the night or need the gun for the night, then you keep it. And you come back, you turn it back in. Now, that's an interesting point you just brought up with traveling. So is there any change with a silencer if you're traveling with an FFL? For instance, you have to notify ATF, hey, I'm traveling from this state to this state, and I'm going to be carrying it. Do mm-hmm. you all the same rules apply even with so an that's FFL? that's not clear. And the reason it's not clear is I've looked into it and talked to a bunch of people, and my advice to FFLs is no, you don't have to worry about the notification because when an employee is traveling with a, any firearm, not just NFA firearms, for a bona fide business purpose, they are counted as like they're an extension of the licensed premises. Because the reason is you can't conduct business activity for your FFL off of your licensed location unless it is a legitimate gun show. So if it's not an actual gun show, I can't drive over to your house, for example, sell you the gun and fill out the paperwork at your house. You have to come to my house. 
So all business must be done at the licensed premises. And also if a firearm leaves the licensed premises, it needs to come off of my bound book somehow, either transferred to a customer via a 4473 and background check or transferred to another dealer. So it cannot even leave the location without being logged out. Now, the exemption is an employee takes it. If an employee takes it for bona fide business purpose, they're counted as an extension of the location so it doesn't get logged out. So the ATF can actually show up for an inspection and you could have 100 guns on your books and have no guns there. And you won't get in trouble for missing all your guns if you just say, oh no, look, Joe Bob salesman, here's a list. And you have to keep a list, but it can be on a piece of paper. It doesn't need to be in your official records, just any type of list. No, look, Joe Bob took all 100 guns to the SHOT Show. Every gun at the SHOT Show is counted as being on the licensed business premises. So that's why I think, but it's not clear. That's why I've always treated it as when an employee goes, no, you just go. You just travel around. Now you need to obey the state laws. You better not walk through Manhattan with a machine gun. I don't care. Your FFL is not going to help you with that. But when it comes to traveling, no, I just keep it on the location, especially when you have an FFL. And man, you talk about being easy on things. You go to walk into a UPS store and before they tell you no, you just go, oh, I got an FFL. Like even a U.S. post office where you're not allowed to have guns, they have no gun signs all over the place. I ship guns from the U.S. Postal, post office all the time. Because if you have an FFL, you're allowed to. So I'll walk in with a gun case and you get some weird looks. You walk up to the counter in the post office and boom, hey, got a gun here. And they're usually used to it. And you just hold up your piece of paper go, got an FFL. They go, oh, no problem, sir. And they help you out. It's actually kind of cool. Gives you a lot of freedoms. That's cool. Yeah, it is cool. So I think we just need to hurry up and get you over the hurdle of wanting one. <laughs> and then put you through the course. And then give us the feedback on how the course works. And if it did, I mean, I just had a guy last week, I forget if I mentioned that on the podcast or not, a guy last week texted me. I don't know how he got my number. <laughs> he texted me a picture of his FFL. He was so excited. We got him a manufacturer's type seven FFL in his house in a gated community in Connecticut. So in a little tiny, like quaint town of Connecticut, like super anti-gun Connecticut, super anti-gun town got himself a manufacturer's FFL in his house. And he just used the printed form I used for zoning. He, uh, in the course, I give you the language to use to get like around the zoning issues and get around everything else. And I think it took him two months and like three days. And he's got himself a full on manufacturing. FFL, so it's actually kind of cool. So nice. And I had another idea for your giveaway. Uh, instead of a gun, what about uh, that new fancy rangefinder that you have? No, no, I like that thing. Because <laughs> if I get that rangefinder away, I got to go buy one. <laughs> I guess I got to buy or, the gun too. How about a scope or something like that? There's, oh, I don't know, may, may, maybe everybody can give us some ideas. Gun, scope. That's good. Um, you guys let us know what you want for an idea. And I'm going to pick the coolest, cheapest thing. <laughs> so that's the most. <laughs> Uh, look at the last comments here before I go off with a single member LLC, FFL and SOT. Well, there's a alphabet soup mouthful for you. What constitutes an employee that could hold a demo at a range, a 1099 or what? Great question, Jeff. This is answered in the course, but I'll answer it here for you guys. No, 1099 cannot possess your guns. If the 1099 employee is the same as a stranger, you need a W2 employee. So an actual W2 employee, but they don't have to have a W2 in their hands because you don't give it to them until the end of the year but you need to have shown that they're actually an employee. So I hope that helps you there, Jeff. Uh, what is the superior hunting cartridge for deer to elk size game? 6.5 Creedmoor or 308? Uh, 308. 308. Also, what are the definition disadvantages of the 6.5 for new long range shooter? Uh, don't apologize for asking Tyler. I'm glad you did. Um, I said 308 so quickly is because it doesn't matter to me if the 6.5 is better ballistically, it, like even external ballistics, which is getting to the target and terminal ballistics at the target. And if it was better with internal ballistics in the gun, I still would say 308 because 308's everywhere. Now 6.5 Creedmoor is getting close. So maybe I'll change my tune someday, but there are way more guns than 308 out there. It is the standard. And I could be at a gas station in Alaska and I bet I can find 308 in the gas station where they sell, they, seriously in Alaska, they sell ammo behind the, the counter. Yep. Um, I bet I can find 308 before I could find 6.5 Creedmoor, or at least I have a better bet to do it. So I also like it because 308 hits a little harder. I know the energy calculation uh, values speed over mass. It actually squares the velocity instead of just the mass. But I believe more for hunting and momentum, uh, which is just the mass times the speed. So the speed doesn't get double the value or, or squared the value. And 308s, when I shoot steel targets, 
Uh, there's plenty of times I shoot a steel target with 6.5 Creedmoor that barely moves, and you hit the 308 and it swings and it dings. So I like 308 for hunting. That's just me. How about a private class with Ryan to give it away? No, I don't know who you guys are. I mean, I'm <laughs> sure you're cool, Aiden for Roberto, but <laughs> that, that, that could be the beginning of a bad story. Um, maybe. Maybe a private class subject to something. I don't know. Um, I, like where, I like where Stevens has that, man. What do you say? Splitting it. He's telling the, you to split the money with me on the shirts. It's my name, too. I like it. That's true. All right. No, I'm joking. <laughs> but we have a big family. We have to cut everyone else out. So I'll, sp I'll split the name with you, but not the logo. How about that? Perfect. Rocket FFL free. Yeah, sure thing. Brandon, I'll do that. Matter of fact, Brandon, email me, and I'll give you Rocket FFL for free. Just email me because it was a good idea. Okay, so there you go. So you come up with good ideas, and you get free Rocket FFL. Um, public class, public range. All right, we're going too many on the comments. I'm sorry for everyone listening in their cars uh, around there. <laughs> um, but I appreciate you tuning in. And man, I'm so glad to have the live chat thriving. And you guys for spreading the word. Holy smokes, Jason. I got to show you the graph after this. So as soon as we're done, done with the podcast, I want to share the screen and show you how awesome our listeners are. They are telling everybody and their brother about this podcast. I was talking to somebody. I went to a, a kind of an entrepreneurial conference that was actually a really good time and talking about things for numbers and podcasts, this and that. And they're like, well, so what are you getting for monthly? And I mentioned the numbers of people listening and their eyes got like this big. Oh my gosh, you have all these advertisers and stuff? And no, I, I advertise, so I'm sorry for doing that. But the point is, the reason the numbers are big is because you guys are telling people about it. And I really appreciate it. And Jason, I appreciate having you on here, man. Oh man, it's a blast. I love it. It's been an awesome learning experience and uh, get to hang out with you. So I can't beat that. And I was going to bring up too, uh, I got a text from a buddy this last week. You remember when you did your little video of shooting your thousand yard shot with a 50 cal? Let's not call that a little video, but yeah, I remember. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's funny that it's finally caught up into the world of Facebook. So um, I had a buddy send me a text. Hey, man, just saw the video of your brother shooting that gun. I'm like, Jared? What was Jared shooting? <laughs> so, of course, I look it up and I, I start laughing. I go, no, no, no. That's my cousin, Ryan. That's said, funny. That was, that was done how many years ago? I don't know. A what? Four? Three? Yeah, probably. Yeah. Well, I did a catch up. I saw it on Facebook, too. I think it was like seven or ten million views last time I saw it. it was on there. Oh, it was yeah. Pretty it, was, cool. it was awesome. Yeah, I'm like, hey, jerks that shared the video, you couldn't give me a link to something? Like, but anyway. <laughs> so someone made a comment earlier about the Kleckner boys. You guys aren't kidding. I don't think Jason and I are the best shots, even. I, I don't think we are. We might know the most about guns or we, we work with them the most, but we've actually had a pretty fortunate um, shooting gene pool, I think, for some of the people. So it's kind of cool having the, 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 the Kleckner boys and shooting guns. Well, and then, of course, growing up, our whole family is just nasty competitive. So, And we shoot, so there yeah, you go. Yeah, there you go. So, all right, man. You guys are awesome. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, for the people listening on the podcast only, I apologize if we did too much of the uh, comments and too much of just kind of the banter back and forth. But you know what? Despite some of the comments I've heard that they wanted uh, more of a format to it, I think the rest of the people like the kind of shooting from the hip. So that's what we're going to keep doing unless enough of you complain. I appreciate you tuning in. I appreciate you even more telling other people about it so they can tune in and find out about us. Jason, thanks again, man. And I'll see you next week. Sounds good. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it. All right. Bye-bye.